Thank you, guys. Hello, Vienna. I usually say there's a lot of uh, observer, observers here today, right? How many of you have, are using JavaScript in any way, shape, or form? Plenty of you. Angular 2. RxJS. How many are confused about it? Oh, yeah. Plenty of hands. Great. So I'm in the right stage. I'm going to talk about RxJS and why it's a better async. Because, I mean, we used to live in a world, at least in AngularJS, where we had promises. And we kind of got promises. And then suddenly everything shifted and everything became streams out there. I mean, Rx is uh, reactive extensions, right? So they're there for Java, they're there, there for JavaScript, they're there for a lot of languages. A lot of things have changed. Um, so I'm going to talk about what that means to be reactive. This is me, Google developer expert, Telic developer expert, and uh, just recently at McKinsey. Uh, this is my Twitter tag, in case you're interested of uh, hitting me up with comments. Um, right, so I'm here today to talk about the fact that async is very hard to code without creating things that looked like this. Spaghetti code. and spaghetti code in the form of this. So we have a callback inside of a callback inside of a callback. We were here. We know better by now by using promises, but we were here. And yes, you guessed it. This is called callback hell. And it looks like this. We have a get data, we have get more data, and we have get even more data. And we don't like this anymore. It's just tab upon a tab upon a tab. So what's better? I mentioned this already. Promises are better. This is a better way to structure your calls. You have a then method, and you can just place your calls accordingly, because you have a dependency between your calls. It matters when your async method calls are made. And of course, as of recently, I think Node has async await. And most of us are probably using um, Bubble to, to utilize async await in the uh, ES7 standard. With this, we suddenly have a synchronous looking code. But I'm not here today to talk about the, the fact that async await is great. It is, right? But I'm here to talk about the fact that sometimes async await and promises are not enough. So, why, in the first place, should I learn RxJS over promises? Why? I mean, Am I bringing a gun to a knife fight, or what am I doing? You have, if you have problems with the co uh, connectivity, I mean, yeah, sure, we are at this conference. Was internet working perfectly for all you guys? Uh, all right, I'm going to close that topic. Sore sub subject, right? So uh, your data, if your data in an application behaves otherwise than request response, if it's more like a continuous stream of data, then RxJS might be a good candidate for you. It's not the only kid on the block. There are BaconJS, there is Kefir, there's a lot of libraries that do this for you. RxJS is one of many, and you need to decide if this is a good fit. So if your application is more than request response, if it has a lot of streams being merged together, they come at different intervals, they are more push than pull, then RxJS is the library for you. So essentially, if you got a sync code that looks messy and consists of a lot of endpoints with data, well, as I said before, that behaves differently, then you need some kind of structured way to approach this. And promises are just not good enough in complex scenarios, because they return only one value. They are hard to retry, they have no cancellation capacity, and they don't mix with other async concepts out there. This is really one of the selling points of RxJS, the fact that you can turn any async thing into an observable, into one concept. So therefore, we have RxJS and observables. So what is this observable thing? Well. Think of an observable as a combination of an array and a promise. First off, we got the array. Uh, we have a map function, a filter function, a take. And in the promise, we have a then method. And in that then method, we have a data callback and an error callback. We take those two, the array and the promise, and we combine them. Together, 
we get the observable. But instead of the then, we have the subscribe. This is, of course, a very simplified explanation. A lot of speakers out here are going to say to you, this is all there is to it. Of course, it isn't. But this is a way to start thinking about it. What is it? But if you intermix arrays, promises, cancellation capacity, retries, and a lot more functionality, you get something that's superpowers, right? You get RxJS and the observable. An observable is a simple thing. It's just a function that takes an observer as an argument. If you just, you know, trying to go to the core of it. And an observer, on the other hand, is an object with methods, right? Next, error, and complete. Those are the methods inside of an observer. So this is pretty much the core, the gist of RxJS. There's more to it, of course. But imagine here at the bottom example, we are creating manually an observable by calling this observer, as I said, with the methods next, error, com and complete. This is a very simple observable, but it's still the core foundation of your learning. Looking at this example, we see that if we call the observer next here on the second line, we see that the first uh, callback is being called, if you trace the numbers here. So if we call next, the first callback in the subscribe is going to be hit. If we call error, the second callback is going to be hit. And if we call complete, the very last one is going to be hit. And complete means that it's the end of the stream. We don't expect any more data to come. Questions so far? All right, it's clear. Subscribing. So subscribing is one of those important concepts that you cannot forget about when it comes to RxJS. This is where it kind of differs from promises. So we have a responsibility when it comes to unsubscribe to actually do it. But for you to be able to unsubscribe in the first place, you need to have a reference to it. So what you do is you have your stream that you have created from essentially your stream and your observable is the same thing. So when you have your stream, you do subscribe. Upon calling that, you get a subscription back. That thing at the bottom here, you can call unsubscribe on it. All right? And as you see here, I've kind of said, OK, three seconds in the future, I'm going to do an unsubscribe. But there is more to it than that. When it comes to unsubscribe, you have a responsibility to do it right, especially if you create your own observables. So in this case, I create an observable with an interval. The interval emits data every second. As you see here at the bottom of the create function, I have a function called I am called on unsubscribe. This guy is important. If you create a manual observable without having this, you're not a very good citizen in RxJS land. So if you have an interval or some kind of heavy resources that you allocate, this is where you put code that effectively cancels that on unsubscribe. So don't forget this function. So as you can see here in the timeout, where we call subscription unsubscribe, we are going to call the function that we return. So create this function and make sure that you clean up after yourself. Otherwise, you will have memory leaks. Otherwise, you will have timeouts that just keep on firing. Yes, that's the core foundation of unsubscribe behavior. But of course, the number of times you will create a manual observer is not that many. You will usually use some kind of factory function to do this. There are different options for creating observables. You can use a factory function, as I mentioned. And it might look like this. So there are tons of factory functions inside of RxJS to ensure that it's easy to create observables. You can uh, create it from arrays, from promises, uh, from just static data in the ov operator, or from events or from intervals and so on. So herein lies the strength of RxJS, the ability to intermix different async concepts. So there are lots of factory functions for you to use here. So try to learn the different kind of topics when it comes to what async concepts that you can intermix. And of course, the third option is to take something that's not an observable at all, but you try to wrap it and make it an observable. So the example here, or the th rules that we need to abide by, is the fact that we need to call next when we get data, we need to call error if there's an error, and we need to call complete when we are dead sure that there no more data is going to arrive. Armed with that knowledge, we go to the next slide and the code example. Here we have a vanilla request. 
we just do a get uh, against a certain URL. And when we are on the onload, we are getting our data. So at this point, we can do two things. Because we are dealing with an AJAX request, we know we are only going to get one value. So the first thing we do is call next. And because there are no more values, we call complete. And on the on error, we call the error. And thereby, we have fulfilled the complete API. So regardless of what kind of other async concept you come from, you can always wrap it and make it an observable. All right. So I talked how you can create observables, but that's not really what makes the library itself powerful. It's the fact that there are a lot of operators out there for you to use. And that's going to save a lot of time for you, because today you will most likely write a lot of manual code to do what the operators already do for you. So operators is the thing that gives RxJS its power. There are 60 plus operators. So I'm not going to tell you to, that you need to learn 60 operators. That would be insane. There are, of course, some core operators that you start out with, like five or six operators, and you build your knowledge from there. Think of uh, the operators as belonging to different kind of categories and kind of learn a couple of operators from each category. So I've showed you the construction operators, the one that creates observables. I've, uh, there are also conversion operators. So you can take, a, for example, a promise and turn it into an observable. There are combination operators, there are mathematical operators, and of course, the time-based ones that allows you to do a lot of really cool things with your streams. But as I said, just learn a few from each category, otherwise you're going to be overwhelmed when you start out. And it will typically look like this. You will, have, uh, you will first off create an observable emitting Data here you can see clearly is just very simple data one two three four, and for each operator that you apply, you just chain it. You have chained calls like this: operator, 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 followed lastly by a subscribe. That's what your code is going to look like when you code in RxJS. And the, for all most operators, I would say there exists a marble diagram, a graphical representation. So the way to read this is to say, I have two different streams of data that emits data at different time intervals. And of course, the data is different. What I do with the merge is essentially taking two different streams and turn them into one. At rxmarbles.com, you're able to see what each and every operator pretty much does. It's a great resource. Have a look at it. Also, at the end of the presentation, I will give you a link to a tool that allows you to do this yourself. I think it's called RX Fiddle. Right, so let's look at a couple of operators that exist. I mean, you recognize these from Lodash and similar libraries, right? And, and even in the JavaScript standard itself. You, so you have a map operator, you have a filter operator. So you're continuously working on the data stream. So here you can see that we are adding one to each value, and when we're done with that, we apply the filter operator. So it's a lot of functions being applied one after another. This is one of the most important operators that, that you want to learn about early on. So why is that? It's debugging. Do is what the operator is called. And essentially, where you place it, it matters. So if you look at the first line of rows here, the of operator, you see that we have the values 1 to 3. But if you place the do at this point, it, we're able to spy on each and every value. But if we place it after the filter operator, we know that the filter is going to take away a few values. So the values that we're actually able to look at is going to be less. So it matters where you do is placed, but it's great for debugging. Great one to learn early on. Right, now it gets a bit more complicated, but not that bad. Sometimes you end up in situations where you create observables within an existing observable. And that feels messy, right? So what does that mean? So if we just use a map operator on this, we see that we have a key up event. And for every key up, it's going to generate a value. And inside of that, uh, second map, you see that we're doing an AJAX call. So what's the problem with that? Well, we get a list of observables. If we have a list of observables, for us to be able to get all that data, we need to make sure that we subscribe to each and every emitted observable, which is not nice, right? 
So what we really want to subscribe to is a stream of data, not a stream of observables. So what we need to do is essentially to take that list and just merge that list of observables together into one data stream, one meta stream. So that's really what FlatMap is doing. So FlatMap is able to take every single uh, observable in the list and just create one uh, subscriber, pretty much. Which means that as soon as I create an observable within an observable, if I just do flat map, everything just turns out fine. All right. There is, of course, a very known sibling to flat map that you can also be using, and it's a recommended use when you de deal with Ajax. Because there are situations where flat map is a bad match. You want to be able to abandon sometimes what you're doing if a precondition is changing. So imagine for a second that you have a drop down box of users. So you have that drop down box and you select a user from that. Based on that, it's going to load a bunch of orders. Based on that, you can select an order and that order will in itself load a bunch of products. If you change the first condition, if you change the user, you suddenly have a line of calls that might happen one after another that you don't want. You want to be able to throw those away and only care about the first one, right? So we have changed from uh, Adam as a user to Eva, but we only care about Eva's order suddenly. We only care about her product. So for that reason, we're using another thing than flat map. We're using switch map. So this one has the capability of saying, like, I don't care what you did before if the number one precondition changed. There are, of course, other uses for the switch map, but it's very useful in Ajax contexts. So here you can see we have the get user, get orders by user, get products by user. Again, this is when you have like a dependency between calls. Calls need to happen in a certain order. This wouldn't be complete unless I talk about recipes. So how would you actually code something inside of RxJS? And why does it shine over the conventional way of doing a sync? Well, if you look at a very uh, common example, which is autocomplete, this one lends itself to be modeled in RxJS in a very elegant way. But let's first talk about the requirements of autocomplete. What, what does it mean? So essentially, it means that we listen for keyboard presses, we uh, will only we only want to do a server trip after x number of characters are entered. If we only entered one character, no server trip. If we entered three or more characters, it's suddenly worth trying to do a lookup. We want to do an AJAX call based on unfiltered input. So when we have three characters or more, we want to do an AJAX call, and of course we want to cache responses. The likelihood of that response you know, suddenly having changed is not that great, right? So caching is a thing we always want to have. There is a procedural approach to this, and it looks pretty much like this. So we hook up to a key up on an input, and we have an if statement that says, if we have three characters or more, then first of all, try to look in the cache. If we have the data, then build our autocomplete list. If we don't have the data cached, then we want to do an Ajax call. But, and when we get the Ajax call, we try to build a list based on that, and we try to store it inside of the cache. This is still readable, but imagine if you have a more complex example than this, it's going to get messy. And what we're trying to avoid here is messy looking async code. So the streaming approach is pretty much about looking at your world differently. Look at key up events as a stream of keys that you want to filter. You want to group them in groups of three. Once you did that, every grouping should lead to an Ajax call. And once you have a response back from an Ajax call, you want to map that into a JSON. You pretty much want to dig out the JSON from that response object. Armed with this knowledge of streaming, we can suddenly code it to look like this. It's a very simple, very elegant approach. So you're you can see here that we, we can dig out the value from the input. We can do a filter that says only if we have three characters more. And we can use this very great operator called distinct until changed, which essentially erases every need for a caching function. So this is your built-in caching function in RxJS. This one says, if it doesn't exist in cache, uh, do the Ajax call. If it exists in cache, respond with the cache instead. And Lastly, we have the switch map statement that just grabs JSON. And yeah, so this one pretty much uh, replaces that other code. 
But of course, you can't go to your team lead or your colleagues or your CTO and say, look here, I found this awesome library. I'm, ju I'm just going to replace it. I, I promise I won't break anything, right? We've done that before. So the first thing you need to do is to be armed with the knowledge of how do I actually replace my promise code. I need to learn as much as I know, I know about promises. I need to learn and know the same thing for RxJS before I actually even dare to replace any code lines. There are some cases that we need to know about to feel comfortable uh, before switching. So a simple scenario here with a promise, you have a get data with a then method and then data callback and an error callback. In RxJS, this is pretty much the same thing with a subscribe and you got the extra callback to complete. That's simple. So imagine that you have cascading calls, as I mentioned before, you have a dependency of call that needs to happen. Uh, before another call can happen. So imagine for a second you have the get data method and you're used to doing promise resolve. In RxJS, we do this as this. And we can replace all our thens with switch map. That wasn't so bloody. So we're actually able to pretty easily replace at least that part of cascading calls with RxJS. And as I said before, you have the ability with switch map to actually cancel out that first stream when the precondition changed. So imagine that the one represents the user Adam and the two represents uh, on the second line represents Eva. We have changed to Eva and suddenly we only care about Eva's cascading calls. We don't care about Adam's cascading calls. He's history because we selected another user from our combo box, right? But what about semi-dependent calls, where you actually have calls that go in order, but suddenly you can parallelize your calls? What do you do then? In, with promises, you do promise all. You're able to list X number of promises that you want to arrive at the same time. So how do we do this in RxJS? Very easy, a fork join. This is the exact one-to-one -one, uh, replacement. So now we're armed with the knowledge of being able to code exactly what we do with promises. So at this point, we can actually enjoy RxJS and actually use the added feature that it has over promises. But of course, I need to be the party crasher here and talk about errors. We all hate errors, but we need a structured approach of how to handle errors. All right, long sigh, right? There are three different approaches you can take with errors. One of them is catch and transform. The other is to ignore them completely. And the third is to retry till it works, because we have hope as programmers, right? Sooner or later, that call we're trying to make is going to succeed. So if you look at the base case here, where we do nothing, where stuff just fails for us, we have an observer next, and after that, we have a throw. This one's going to crash out, so it's going to emit the first value. The second thing to happen is that it's going to hit the error callback, but it will never hit the complete. So the third callback will never be hit with this. So we need to patch it somehow, make it behave. So we add the catch operator to it. So suddenly when we add the catch operator, we have the ability to uh, tell it like, OK, you used to be an error, but now I can make you into a data again. So what happens here is that the one is going to be emitted, the error is going to be caught, and uh, re-streamed uh, into this. So as you see here, the data callback is going to be hit twice, once with the one and one with the error. This might not always be the case that you want, because this is effectively swallowing the error, right? It's like business as usual. You can be ignoring the error. So when do we want to do that? Imagine that you have data sources that come from different places. You have three or four different APIs, three or four different streams. And you want to make sure that only the strong streams survive. You don't care about the error streams. So let's first see what happens if we do nothing. Here we have a case that we merge three different data sources. We have that really bad data sources in the middle here. You see the one that does throw, right? It's going to ruin the party for every single stream that's under it. So the first stream is going to emit its values. It's like a one, a two, a three. And then the throw comes. It's like, yep, party is over, folks. There is a way to fix this. You can just change your merge call into something called on error resume next. This one will treat every error as like, I don't care about you. I'm going to throw you away. So it's effectively going to say, I'm only going to care about the ones that behave. 
So remember this method if you have a scenario where you merge data sources from different places. Retry is kind of the third approach, the uh, last resort, if you will. With retry, there are two different cases. When, one where you just retry x number of times, and the other ones you retry with a certain time interval. So imagine you have a retry where you essentially say, I'm going to retry this five times. So you're effectively delaying when the error callback is going to be hit. So you are an optimist. You're thinking, well, on the first, second, or third attempt, I'm actually going to succeed. Right? Uh, so, so that's really what the simple retry is about. But there is another retry. Th this one says essentially that I'm on a network that might fail sometimes, but it might succeed sometimes. So I still want my stream to behave. And the way to do that is to find a certain number of milliseconds where you kind of delay the next attempt to retry. This might be a very good fit for you in some situations. Of course, testing, right? When it comes to testing a sync, we tend to mock it away. We tend to treat it like a synchronous beast. We don't, wanna we don't care about a sync and testing. Everything is synchronous in our heads, right? That's why we have a sync await in the first place. RxJS is actually quite nice to you here. They have changed the approach in which you do testing, but it looks good. But async testing is painful. I, I admit it. So can we test methods that might take two seconds or two minutes to run? I mean, we're all doing continuous integration, and we try to run test. We don't want to wait half an hour for a test suite to run. We want it to run within you know, a couple of seconds, tops. To do that, there is a short answer to, yes, we can actually test a sync code that's written in RxJS. And it's called marble testing. So marble testing, it has an internal virtual clock, which means we can control time as we see fit. Two seconds in your algorithm is two milliseconds when you write your test, which is what you want. It's a visual comparison. So essentially, you set up a situation like this. You have an expected streams where you say, data, time passes, data, time passes, error. That's what this first one means. So you compare this to an actual stream of outputted values. There's a lot of weird symbols in here, but I'm going to explain what they mean. So the dash means time increment has passed. The pipe means the end of stream has been reached. Hashtag means an error. And XYZ is just replacement values for you know, any value that your stream emits. So let's see some code. What does this look like? So imagine you have the arrange scenario where you set up the XYZ and some time that passes, the dashes. Imagine that you are mapping x to 1, y to 2, and so on. You have a way to replace those, right? And you have the act stage where you create an hot observable that has a virtual clock, as I said. We control time. And you have my algorithm. This is your actual code, your production code, if you will. And in here, we just give it the hot observable, and you apply a bunch of operators to it, right? Uh, and the third stage, the assertion stage. At this stage, you can just say, OK, actual versus expected, are you the same thing? And the flush operation is going to essentially just trigger the uh, whole operation. It's a quite simple approach. And this is valid for everything you do. So in summary, RxJS shines when your async is complex. Observables can be created from almost any async concepts. They enable rich composition because you're able to mix mouse events with async concepts. Observables are very easy to retry. Uh, RxJS can easily be tested with marble testing. Cancellation with unsubscribe is very easy, and you should definitely do it, remember? And it's not ketchup. Please don't use it everywhere. Some further reading, really quickly. I have a free book. It's on angular.io slash resources. It's called RxJS Ultimate. It's uh, going to take you a few days to read it through. It's always going to be free. I really would appreciate some comments on it. Uh, Reactive, the other link here is the official documentation. And I just discovered this awesome tool called rxfiddle.net, where you can just paste your uh, Rx code, and you're able to see a visual thing of what your code looks like. That's all, folks. Thank you. Thanks, Chris for this awesome talk. Um, I guess we have time for some questions now. Are there any questions here? Here is one question. Where is our mic?
Ah, perfect. Ah. In the meantime, I will ask a question, right? Because I'm very interested in this topic. And I believe there is a fourth method to catch errors. Is it true that you can put um, the part where the error accrues, occurs in a switch map? Uh, so the first stream will not die, and the switch map dies, and then you can replace it with the next one? That is very true. Uh, so that's a very good uh, case for switch map, because you're able to isolate your you know, business code to your other code. So you, you tend to use switch map as a way to kind of protect your code in that sense. So you're very right. And I think that's the best practice from Ben Lesh even. So. You got me. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, is the mic there? Oh, perfect. Yeah, Let's start. Hello, my name is Milan. A quick question. Could you please briefly explain the difference between hot and cold observables? Of course. So a cold observable means that you get your own copy. So if we have two subscribers to the same RxJS stream, that means uh, I will get one, two, three, and you will get one, two, three. But if I have a hot observable, if, if that observable uh, starts uh, emitting right away and you're late to the party, you might get a three because one and two has passed you by. So imagine that the hot observable is more like a live stream in football and you join the match after 23 minutes, whereas I join in minutes zero. And the cold observable is more like a, a episode that you recorded. So w when you watch that recording, you're not affecting anyone else. But hot observables does affect everyone else, and it's essentially like a live streaming. Thanks a lot. Sure. Raise hands for questions, please. Here, here. I guess here. No? no. OK, here, here. Hands? Hands, please. Thank please raise hands again. Yep. Here. First one. Hi. Hi. Do you know any easy way to convert or to create observable from callbacks? For example, you have some legacy framework and you don't own the code of this legacy library. Mm. So you remember that wrapping thing I did? So essentially, when you have a callback, what you're trying to do is to make sure that you fulfill the next and error and the complete on the observer. So essentially, you just have an outer create, you know, remember that create method. You have that outside. but. In the case, if it's a node callback, there is already a factor method for it. So I would have a brief look at what factor method exists. Because for some callbacks, you need to write that create statement yourself. For Node.js callbacks, there exists one. So uh, have a look at the documentation. The next question is here. Why no back pressure? I know this, this is a, a war between the Java and JavaScript guys, but what's your answer to that? Oh, uh, you mean why there's a push over a pull, or? No, wh why there's no back pressure implemented in the current standard? I have to owe you the answer to that one. I will have a look. Um. Maybe one last question before you have to leave. Raise hands if you have questions. If not, the Q&A is over now. All right, okay. thank you, Vienna. Thanks. Awesome talk.